We continue with uh, Laura Roth from Barcelona and Comú. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so, well, as you know, I'm going to talk about um, Barcelona and Comú. Um, first, I'm going to uh, explain the story very briefly uh, for the people who don't know some of the details. And then I wanted to to describe some of the what what we see as the like the main elements of the experience of Barcelona and Comú. Um, this will be like a very general description of some topics. And then I, th I thought it, it would be a good idea to do this so that then in the questions you can ask for more precise uh, stuff and and then but we can get to the details with like with the broad picture in mind so um so the situation in uh, this this will probably sound familiar the situation in spain as in as in other places around uh, 2011 was was uh well after a couple of years of of uh, economic crisis uh was not only not only uh it, it didn't only have a social and economic economical dimension but it, it also had a political dimension uh, and we the idea was that there, there was a crisis of representation that institutions didn't represent the people anymore because of the way they were dealing with the crisis uh, specifically but for other reasons as well and um, so this was one of the ideas that was behind the 15m uh, movement and well the indignados movement and the, um, and the idea in those uh, years was that uh, or at least in, in 15M was that anyone, just any ordinary person, should be able to show up and participate uh, in, in political activities. Uh, and in 15M, this was one of the main uh, characteristics, that people didn't need to belong to any previously existing political party, union, movement, group, anything. Just ordinary people could, could ju just show up. And the idea was um, that uh, that the, the political system should be changed, that it should be more democratic. Uh, the, the, the general claim was, uh, the slogan was that they don't represent us. Uh, but it was also a matter of actually implementing democracy. So 15MM was a, an experience of being together, debating, uh, deciding, without any specific goal, without any specific aim, but it was a matter of exercising democracy. And this, I mention this because it shaped the way we, many of us, see, uh, saw politics after these events. They, it had a very big uh, impact in our in our personal lives, um, especially for people who were disenchanted with politics, especially for young people, for people who didn't didn't think that voting made sense, for instance, or participating in any kind of political activity made any sense. And three years later, uh, 2014. The, the project of Barcelona and Comú started. Uh, many people stayed active after, after 15M, uh, and they joined cer certain platforms and movements and, and their neighbors' associations and different kinds of activities. But there was this idea that there was an invisible, um, I call it a, like an invisible class ceiling. Uh, there, there's, there was a limit to what could be done from outside political institutions. And therefore we needed to go from lobbying, protesting, criticizing, to actually building alternatives from within those institutions. And this, one, this was one of the ideas. The other one was that we should go from segmented struggles to a more unitary proposal. 
And this is why a municipalist uh, platform was created. Uh, because we, we observed that all those struggles were actually connected to each other. And it, it didn't make sense to divide our efforts. So the, the decision was simply to win the city council in the case of Barcelona. Um, and that, that's what actually the first name of the platform meant. Guanyem means let's win. Uh, then we had to change the name for well, legal problems. It doesn't matter. Um, and we changed it to Barcelona en Comú, but that was the main idea. And the, the, main, the, the main purpose was to do things differently, not only to present an, a, different, a new political platform, but to do everything different from the beginning. So we started with three um, main steps. First, writing a code of ethics uh, through crowdsourcing. So er, like, uh, it was an open process where anyone could participate and make proposals about what representatives and people who went into institutions should, um, the, the, the minimum, the minima that they, they should um, respect in order to exercise those, those positions. Like, and, the, and as I mentioned yesterday, there was a limitation of salaries, of how many terms you could be in office, and many other things. Uh, then we created a crowdsource program. We didn't present a specific electoral program. We opened it for citizens to decide uh, what the content of that program should be. And then they could make proposals and vote for the proposals made by others. Um, and we also implemented uh, alternative financing. We didn't ask for any loans to financial institutions. We used micro lending and, mic and crowdfunding to fund the platform. And these three examples, uh, they share this, this concern the, that we needed to change the way we did everything in politics and not simply to win to implement, in order to implement progressive policies. It's connected to what, what you were just mentioning before. And, uh, and therefore, we needed to uh, trust ordinary people. It might sound a bit strange to open all these processes, processes to ordinary people, for them to say what they want to include in the program, or what they, what they want to include in a code of ethics. But without that, it didn't make any sense to, to start this, this political project. Uh, and actually, the consequence of this was that people were immediately engaged with the, pro with the project. Because if you just offer uh, something, they might like it. But if you ask them to do something, it, it gets a completely new meaning for, for everyone. Uh, because they, they feel uh, they have a specific role to play in this process. And that, that was a key uh, for, for the, well, for the well, I, I would say for the success, in the, in the, especially in the first year of the, of the platform. And then, as you know, we won the elections. The bad side of it is that we only have 11 uh, representatives out of 41. It means that it's a minority government. We cannot change legislation at the city, go at the city level. And there are many other obstacles. Um, we face well the, the opposition, the press, uh, other power actors. Um, but we're still doing things. And so we, we can, if, if you're interested, I can mention some of the, some of the examples of, of specific policies that we've been implementing. But as I said, the focus wasn't those policies, but changing the way we thought about the institution and politics. So I'm going to focus on this second part. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, the, um, I wanted to describe some of the main elements of the experience of Barcelona en Comú. Uh, the first one, and this um, became evident from the very beginning, is that we changed the discourse uh, of politics in, in Barcelona. The key element was bringing back uh, local politics to the people who actually live in the city. 
and not merely, as I said, to implement leftist policies. Um, and yeah, so I mentioned a couple of examples of how we started developing this um, from the very beginning. And this way of doing things also became, um, you, can, we, you could also see it as part of the uh, electoral strategy, right? Because it, um, it wasn't merely about actually engaging people, but engaging them was the way of getting more support. So changing the discourse and changing the practices was, was also um, part of the strategy from the beginning. And the diagnosis was that it wasn't possible to reach people through the traditional discourses of the left in a context where there was a great dissatisfaction with institutional politics and people had a relatively negative um, opinion of traditional uh, leftist actors like unions and traditional parties. Uh, in a, and in a context where uh, maybe that wasn't, the, the, the case in Barcelona wasn't so clear, but in many other contexts, it seems that the right-wing discourses are more attractive than the left-wing discourses because they tend to refer to uh, more simple, uh, ordinary problems. And the sophisticated discourse of the left wasn't engaging uh, anyone. So this is one element. Another one is that the discourse, the discourse was not one of confrontation, which was a bit difficult because many people came from uh, social movements and, and we were used to criticizing, as, as I was also mentioning yesterday. Um, it, it is difficult to, to change that if you want to, to um, well, it, it, is, it is difficult. And the, but we realized that if we, the, the step that we were taking wasn't about, wasn't connected to destroying anything, it was connected to building an alternative. So the discourse should, needed to be constructive as well. And people responded to this. Uh, if, um, and this is also connected to what I was mentioning about uh, right-wing discourses. Usually they don't talk about destroying things. They talk about safety, they talk about um, uh, making you feel uh, better. And, and we thought, why uh, shouldn't we do the same but with a real proposal? Um, and also, the, the, as, I men, as I also mentioned yesterday, the, the confrontation discourse is, is quite masculine. And we think also as a matter of principle, it's not a discourse that we should promote in politics. Should, politics shouldn't be about destroying the others, even if you don't agree with them. It should be about uh, constructing alternatives together, about the common good, about the commons. And this was part of our, our identity as a platform. Um, so yeah, I, I think that yeah that that um, I could say more about the discourse if if you want. I can I can say it later. Um, then the second element was not only changing the discourse but actually implementing what we call radical democracy. Uh, sometimes it is argued that people don't care about politics and it might have been true for some for some times for some time if you look at this from a certain point of view if you look at uh, turnout uh, uh, numbers or um, how many newspapers people read but if but this is not true actually um, studies about political culture uh, that are done worldwide show that people value democracy but not, but just not the kind of democracy <laughs> that they have. Not, not the kind of, of system that there's in place. Um, they want to, they, yeah, they, people value democracy as a, as a, as a way of self-government and, and promote uh, as, as connected to the promotion of equality, but not uh, as choosing someone and obtaining something in return. Because that doesn't, they, the people know that doesn't work. Um, so then, on the, on the one hand, we tried to bring democracy into our organization. Uh, 
The first thing that we did is that we didn't build a coalition of parties. And we built what we call a confluence. This means um, it's a, it's a bottom-up approach where people participate as individuals, even if they belong to other parties or organizations, even movements they join the platform as individuals. So anyone should sign up individually to this new platform. Um, and no one, this means that no one needs to present a CV to participate. As in this, it's the same for someone who comes from a political party with a long history, and for someone who comes from um, home and hasn't been doing anything for, um, for 20 years. Uh, it puts people in an equal uh, position. Um, and then, this was at the beginning. Uh, it, it also affected the legal shape of the platform because it wasn't a coalition. Um, and then, in the practices of the, of the platform, it also meant that no one should use their membership to a group or a party as an argument. In, in, uh, in a discussion. And we, we, um, we started uh, implementing this, this practice of reminding each other that we shouldn't use these kinds of arguments when we uh, discussed about stuff. Uh, so there was no, uh, the, the, the aim was that there were no quotas, no, um, uh, no, uh, you couldn't speak in the name of more people. You, you, you should, everyone should just speak in their own name. And it changed the whole dynamics of the, of the, of the platform compared to, to uh, previous ex experiences of coalitions. And, and then another element is, um, I also, sort of mentioned this yesterday, that different forms of participation should be possible. And we have two ways of participating as an activist, which means that you are, an act, you are active in a certain group, uh, or as a sympathizer. And this means that you can um, have a more um, loose relationship with the platform, and you can decide when you participate and when you don't participate. This allows for many people to have a a, a certain connection with the platform, but not. But if they don't have the time to be very active, they they don't need to. Um, and in any case, we we have specific decisions, like the main decisions that uh, are open for the vote of everyone. And anyone can just sign up for either uh, way of um, um, of uh, engagement at any point, like any person. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we also have this online platform to make certain decisions, and we are developing it more in order to become a, also a debate um, platform, so we can discuss and not, on, not only vote uh, when, when there's an important decision. Then the organization is structured around neighborhoods, uh, and thematic groups. Um, this means that they are uh, partially autonomous. They decide which kinds of activities they want to develop, um, how they want to organize, make many, many things. They need to follow certain principles, but they, they basically decide what they want to do. And the thematic groups, it's, it's the same. Um, and all of those groups, uh, are represented in coordination um, in, in, yeah, in, um, this, in other decision-making bodies that, are coordi the, that coordinate all those, those um, individual groups. And then we have a general coordination that includes representatives of all the different groups in the, in the um, platform. Um, so that's how the ordinary that the daily activities of the platform are organized. And then we also have what we call the plenary, is an open um, session where all the activists can participate. We just meet every, usually, I don't know, every month or every two months to debate and to vote for the main um, 
uh, decisions and topics that, that we need to address. Um, yeah, so those are the, like, the main, the main um, organs and, and ways of participating. Um, and then, as I said, we, we try to implement democracy within the organization, but also uh, from the city council. Uh, and this, this was one of the main uh, issues in our, in our electoral campaign, actually, bringing democracy to the city council, reforming the institutions of the city council. Um, and this is a, I mean, as you can imagine, this is a slow pro project. Uh, developing such a such a uh, such a policy is is not something that you can do in a couple of months. Um, but some of the things that we have done is uh, first, I think I mentioned this yesterday as well. We we started an ambitious participatory process to create the strategic plans for the city and for each district in the city. And thousands and thousands of people participated in this, in this uh, process. They could participate online, but also in face-to-face -face meetings. There were hundreds of face-to-face -face meetings about specific topics, and they were connected to the, to the um, online platform. It, it's a quite sophisticated uh, process. If you're interested, there, there's some information I could, I could um, send you about this. Um, then, we, were, we are also reforming the existing participatory institutions at the city level and at the district level because th there were some participation spaces in place, but they didn't work very well. So we are reforming them in try trying to make them more dynamic uh, so that people feel they ha it makes sense to participate in those, in those organs. Um, then there were certain specific strategic plans that were developed also through participatory processes like the strategic plan for touristic degrowth that is it's one of the most important uh, thing that we have done in, in in the city actually maybe it's difficult to understand it from a point of view of uh, other place from the point of view of other places but in Barcelona tourism is um, is a very serious problem and it's displacing population uh, and it, it generates a terrible housing problem. And the strategic plan of um, a degrowth plan was developed through a participatory process as well. And this made the plan get uh, much uh, greater legitimacy. And it's, now it's viewed as a, as a as an important policy that the city council will be implementing. Um, and then there are other examples of, of things that we are doing in terms of participation, like uh, uh, participatory budgeting, um, yeah, and, and participation in specific areas. There are thematic, um, like councils, and well, many other examples. Um, then the third element, so I mentioned the first one was a discourse, the second one was radical democracy. The third element is what we call uh, the feminization of politics. Um, and this doesn't mean, doesn't merely mean having a female mayor, which is important. And it, it symbolically, it was a big, a big issue. It was the first time that Barcelona had a female mayor, for instance. Um, but it means three um, different things. Um, first, promoting, it means promoting gender balance and gender equality within our organization constantly. Um, this means not only having uh, equal representation in every organ, uh, we cannot have men occupying two men occupying a position and no women for no woman for instance and things like that. We we always respect the uh, equality, uh, gender equality in every uh, organ of the organization. Um, we also control the time of interventions, for instance. Uh, this means limiting long speeches made by men who love to listen to themselves and 
than women feeling that they don't have in anything interesting to say be because it would be enough to say those things in one minute instead of 15. So we also control, some, we do two things. First, we sometimes we use like, we make like two minute interventions and then an alarm sounds and every, people should just uh, stop speaking. And we also track how many interventions and for how long uh, men and women speak. And then at, at the end of a session, we uh, mentioned this, like, I don't know, 70% of the time was occupied by men and 30 by women and how many of uh, each spoke. And making this visible has also helped um, people be aware of, of the weight of this uh, in our um, practices. Um, so feminization of politics means this, uh, so gender balance. It means applying policies that promote gender equality, of course. In the program we have uh, policies that, that go in this direction. Uh, so it means promoting a more egalitarian society. Things like public support for care services, for, um, I don't know, for women who are in a, in a I don't know, in a vulnerable situation. Uh, something that we just approved last week is a, a, a manual for the gender analysis of urban planning, for instance. Um, how the urban design affects women and men differently in terms of safety, for instance, and many other things. Um, yeah, and there are many other examples. And, and the third element of the feminization of politics is um, paying attention to the relational dimension of politics. This means looking at the forms of political action, if they are uh, um, favoring men instead of women, if they make men feel more comfortable than women, uh, think like, things like that. Not because there are any female or male uh, characteristics that are intrinsic, but because it affects the possibility of people <laughs> to participate. If I, I don't know, for many women, if, if a context is too confrontational, for instance, they don't feel comfortable and they just take a step and back and they don't uh, run for, uh, for uh, they don't present a candidacy or things like that. It's, it's quite common for these things to happen. Um, so, um, yeah. So paying attention to the forms of political action, to the small practices where gender inequalities are reproduced, like, I don't know, who takes notes, who chairs, who um, does the, I don't know, paperwork, small details. Um, then another thing is um, focusing on not making great plans if we cannot change the small things, uh, which is also, uh, there's a gender bias there, usually. We believe that small victories in, in changing real things uh, is, um, is a way of um, first making great changes more sustainable, but also um, making the, breaking the cycles of pessimism and things like that. And in addition to that, it means acting in the places where inequalities are actually reproduced and not forgetting about small things because you have more important things that you need to uh, generate now. I mean, it, it doesn't matter how many men and women we put on the list because we need to win or things like that. No, it does matter because in the long run, it's difficult to change those, those things if you don't do it now. So things like that are also connected to the feminization of politics. Um, I also mentioned the confrontational um, style, this winner takes all logics of politics. We try to focus on uh, the politics of the commons and the common good instead. Um, also stop, it also means stop, stop to, uh, to divide the public from the private so clearly because those two are connected and uh, it means acting in both uh, spheres and trying to uh, relate them more in your discourse, in your practices, 
Um, because otherwise it means that women will always carry a, a greater weight. Uh, and then uh, it also means accepting diversity and complexity as something positive, uh, not uh, simplifying the world, but yeah, connect, uh, uh, recognizing the, the complexity of, of our political life. These, uh, these ideas connected to the, to the feminization of politics, uh, we think that um, they're quite different from the logics behind uh, some experience, experiences of left-wing populism, right? That's why we don't want to follow that kind of strategy. In a, in a, con in a political context, in, in many countries at least, it seems that the, the proposal against right-wing populism or against right in general is to uh, promote a left-wing populism. I'm thinking about Podemos, about, I don't know, many other experiences and proposals that are developing in, in Italy, in um, also DiEM25, for instance, uh, there are many, many um, well-intended proposals that are trying to implement left-wing projects, but with, uh, log with logics that are quite different from this, um, like starting small from the bottom up approach. And, and we think that this, this presents a great danger for the feminization of politics, and it's a very important priority. Because we, if we cannot change that, then it's difficult for a real change to, to happen. Then, um, so that's about the feminization of politics. And the final element is uh, why, well, the final element is that local politics, we see local politics as the key for future, future political change. Uh, of course, we, well, we, you, can, you can imagine this, we, we think that municipalism is, the, the, uh, is a good political strategy for, and we, we think this for different kinds of reasons. First, because it has a greater potential in terms of feminizing politics, as I just mentioned, uh, compared to action at other levels of government. Second, because it's the only place where we can truly democratize uh, political institutions. It's very hard to have uh, democratic political institutions at the state level because of scale. It's just a, a practical problem. It's very difficult to do that. Maybe in the future we have uh, the technology to do this, but in, in the meantime, we need to uh, democratize institutions now. Um, so locally, this is, of course, much easier. Um, then third, because, the, because state level institutions are not uh, able to, uh, to solve many of the problems that affect us, or they don't want to. Like, um, I don't know, I'm thinking about housing, mobility, a healthy, uh, have, be living in a healthy environment, things like that. They, state institutions don't usually care about these things. And on the other hand, because states are not even able to deal with uh, global problems, uh, that are the ones that affect us now, like poverty, migrations, uh, climate change, and other things. On the other hand, it seems that uh, cities are doing things in this regard. So municipalism as a strategy to win the city government could also mean having a greater impact in, global, uh, in solving or dealing with global issues. And finally, because unlike states, cities can avoid, well, sometimes at least, uh, the logics of nationalities, xenophobia, um, nationalism. Uh, it's much harder to, to use this discourse at the city level because people are more used to living together. And it's easy to use this discourse at the national level because that's how you engage uh, without any real connection. But at the city level, at least what, ha what we have ob observed is that even right-wing parties don't, don't find it easy to use this kind of discourse because it's not really relevant. What people care about when they vote for their city council members is 
whether they will uh, solve practical problems and not whether they are, uh, I don't know, for or against immigr immigration, because the city doesn't do these things. Um, and focusing on the local level and municipal, p promoting a municipalist uh, strategy doesn't mean that we should only work at the local level and isolate from the rest of the world. It doesn't mean uh, producing your own food and your own energy uh, and like being uh, self-sustainable or things like that, growing organic vegetables or things like that. It's not about this. Um, we actually believe that this, we have a responsibility in acting locally because that's how we shape power more broadly. If we, if we can do this in many cities uh, or in many municipalities, then and it's becoming more evident actually um, in, the, in, in the present. Cities are becoming greater actors in, in, at, the local, at the global level. And we think that having true, truly participatory, democratic, um, not only institutions, but also movements at the city level is very important to shape, the, the, to shape politics in general. Uh, and that's why we think that cities should coordinate and work together. And this should occur in two different levels, at the level of institutions on the one side, and at the level of political movements. Uh, political movements who, that work at the city level should cooperate and should learn from each other and should, um, I don't know, start campaigns and, and do stuff together because they are stronger if they do that. So. Yeah, so that's, that's um, it's, it's about working locally and starting small, but having uh, a clear um, direction. And one of the, you, pro you can probably imagine, I don't know, there are many examples of how this could work and why it's relevant. I think that the examples of the refugee crisis is one of the most interesting and the, the newest ones. And in the case of, um, I will just explain how it worked in, in the case of Barcelona. Uh, when the refugee crisis started, the Spanish government said that, um, <clears throat> so it agreed with the European Union that the state um, would accept 1,500 refugees, right? Um, this was a couple of years ago, if I'm not wrong, or the beginning of last year. Uh, last year, Barcelona, the government of Barcelona announced that it will be willing to accept all those people only in, in the city of Barcelona. And then many other cities in the, in, the, in the Spanish states started to say the same thing. So, okay, we have the infra infrastructure to, to have these people and to push the, city, the, the Spanish government to uh, reconsider this decision. The, as a consequence of what cities have uh, done, the Spanish uh, government was forced to increase the number of refugees from 1,500 to 17,000 people. And it, it actually changed this. It changed the agreement with the European Union. Then the story becomes a bit darker again because the, it, it wasn't actually doing anything to bring those people to the, to the state. Uh, it, it was delaying the, the, um, the process. But a couple of weeks ago, the European Union sanctioned the um, Spanish government because it wasn't um, respecting the, the agreement. Also as a consequence of cities going to the European Union and claiming that the Spanish government wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. So maybe it's a small example, but I think that we are starting to see the potential of this kind of, of action. In the US, it's also quite interesting what is happening now that Trump won. Many cities are coordinating to stand up against certain uh, policies. So I think, um, I don't know, we, we have a local responsibility to, to do things and to, um, to do politics politics differently, but, not, but, but it's not only about what's happening in our cities, which is very important, of course. Uh, changing how, how we live in our cities is 
is the first thing that we, we need to think about. But we also have a greater responsibility, I think, not only with our cities, but with other movements and platforms and institutions in other cities, uh, because we need to support each other. And therefore, we need to, and in order to address important problems, we need to, to act together. So I don't want to put too much pressure here, but <laughs> it's important that you do things uh, right and that you don't lose um, the illusion, the, the illusion, no, the, the, yeah, the, um, uh, the energy to do these things. And yeah, I will leave it here. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Do we have any? Uh, I already have one, uh, and if there are other hands and people just raise and so, Marina. Thanks. Thank you for your presentation. It was great as well as the previous one. And I wanted to ask you actually this um, to, to to say something more about um, this process of engaging people in the in the process. Um, we heard something about it also from the previous presentation, but I found it quite crucial. I find it quite, quite crucial for this um, thing to succeed. <laughs> and that is the first question. The second one is about um, just uh, this having vote in uh, plenary sessions. So who has the right to vote? Thanks. I will start with the second one, it's easier. Uh, so as I said, we have two lists of people. One, uh, uh, one of them is um, the activists, people who are active in a certain group, and the other one is the sympathizers. The plen in the plenary, only activists can participate. Usually, um, so it's around, uh, I think that the numbers nowadays are around um, 1,200 people that are active somewhere. Not, not all of them are very active, but that's the list that we have. Not, and not everyone can come to the meetings, of course. Not everyone is interested, but I don't know. The, the number of people that show up, usually, it's usually between 300 and 500, depending on the kind of, of decision and of issue. Um, and we just, yeah, and they just vote. Oh, okay. So each group has a, it has autonomy to, to it uh, manages their own list. So each group manages manages its own list. Sorry, uh, and they um, inform uh, when there are changes in this list. And we have the general list, and each group the, um, keeps track of who's active and who's not. And yeah, they they update those those lists. Um, yeah, sure. So, is there a possibility to get out of the list as well? Someone put you out of the list, yeah. or you saying, I'm not. So, how does it work? Does it work uh, in order people have to say, I, I cannot be active anymore, or you're just you know, you know. Okay. Uh, usually, people s say when they, they don't want to be active anymore. But sometimes it happens that people just don't show up and they forget and then, and at some, so the, we have a protocol, it doesn't work very well always because people, some people don't like being asked if they are active or not. And so we, we basically send an email to the person saying, hey, are you still interested or not? Tell us what you want to do, otherwise we will need to uh, get you off the list. And usually people respond, but sometimes it ha there there have been a couple of cases where we just took people from the list and then they were angry about this. I mean, but I mean it's something that can happen, yeah. So, um, and then about engaging people, uh, I would say I don't know. It's something that you need to learn. Uh, while you do it. It's not, it's, I, I don't think it's easy to find like solutions for this. But I would say three things. First, uh, you cannot engage people if you don't trust them. And this means not only trust 
Uh, not only because you don't need to know people beforehand in order to let them participate, uh, but also you need to be willing to give them responsibilities. And this is the second thing. It's very difficult for people to engage if they don't have anything to do. So especially during the first stages of our campaign, one of the most important things, so we, we did di different things. Uh, we organized meetings um, on, like, on the square, like open meetings where anyone can come, anyone can, can, could sign up. Uh, but then you need to give people things to do. And this means giving them cert a certain amount of autonomy to, I know, to organize groups, to decide how they want to organize things. You cannot control everything. Uh, so it's two things. So, so trust on the one hand and then giving them actual <laughs> tasks and projects. Because otherwise, if they just show up to meetings, at some point they will be tired and they don't want to, be, I don't know, it depends probably on the person, but many people don't want to go somewhere and listen. They, if they want to sign up for something like this, they want to feel that they are, that their participation is relevant somehow. And that's why I think the, the three, th three things I mentioned worked so well, like the designing the code of ethics, the program and, um, and also the crowdfunding. Uh, because people had the opportunity to, to say something, to do something, and they saw that it, they had an impact in the des and on the decision. It wasn't just symbolical. Symbolic, sorry. Um, yeah, and then letting groups uh, self-organize. It doesn't mean not coordinating those groups or anything. You need to coordinate because otherwise it becomes chaotic, but you need to give to trust people that you don't know. Um, and that's, yeah, it could go wrong. And we have some bad experiences as well, but it doesn't matter because we are, there's a lot of us. And so if, we ha and if there are bad experiences, there, yeah, there are just a, just a few examples. So it doesn't matter in the end. And then the final thing I would say, uh, it also means including people that are different from us. Because it's, it's really easy to do uh, things with young people who are more or less educated and who share your ideas and your, I don't know, your interests and stuff and that you have a good time with. But it's not possible to do anything just with those. Uh, so it cannot be a group of friends. Uh, you need to trust old people, you need to trust younger people, you need to, um, yeah, and, and also to give them things to do and to give them responsibilities. Um, so I think that, at least for us, I think these, these things were the key. And then after winning the elections, it became a whole new problem because it's easy to be engaged during the campaign because it's, there's, lo there's lots of things to do. Uh, and then it becomes more complicated. But then we, what we did is to try to find alternative projects and to transform the organization into an organization that can also, it's not merely supporting the institution, but also doing other things. We have, I don't know, neighbor groups organize, I don't know, they screen films, they organize campaigns, they, they organize debates on the street, in their, in their, um, um, in their, where they meet. Um, I don't know, they do many things, uh, whatever they want to do, actually. They organize meetings with people from the city council, uh, thematic groups organize um, different kinds of activities as well. Now we, we started a school, like a school, yeah, like um, a series of courses around different kinds of issues. Some of them are open, some of them are, some of them are only for people from the platform. We also use them, so all the money that, uh, so since we have a limitation of the salaries, the money that people don't um, receive, that representatives don't receive, we couldn't change the law, we tried, but uh, 
uh, so the, the the amount of money they receive is the same, but they give some of part of this to the organization, and we use this for social uh, projects. And now we have a platform where people can present projects, and we finance those projects. And this also means, like, I don't know, finding ways of doing things. I'd say, yeah, that's important. Mm, so you mentioned all these different types of decision-making bodies, like the you have plenary session, then you have a group of coordinators, then you have neighborhood groups, then you have uh, different topics, uh, groups with different topics, etc. So I was wondering, um, uh, okay, this seems like a complex system, and but who makes what kind of decisions, if you get what I mean? Because um, from my experience, if you put all the decisions uh, in, a centralized, in a centralized way, you know, so that the people that are on plenary sessions decide on everything, then you may have people that are frustrated with this type of process and it can uh, get slow. And on the other hand, if you don't uh, uh, democratize decision-making process in a way, then you also have frustrations on the other side. So I think that, you know, um, there is some kind of balance that has to be accomplished. Uh, so I'm wondering, um, you know, uh, how you accomplish this. Uh, so who makes what sort of decisions and how, the, how does the system work? Uh, so that's one question. Another one is about the online platform. Uh, you mentioned that you have like a voting system, but now you're thinking of opening up discussion boards. So how come uh, you had only a voting system at first and now you have discussion board? And uh, in a question in general, like what, you know, when you think about the time that you were setting up this uh, uh, decision making um, uh, system, let's call it like that. So what were your uh, like main concerns and then main challenges you faced and how you solved them, like the main problems you had? Regarding what, sorry? Regarding uh, decision making systems, okay. so when you, when you started doing it, so what were the main challenges you faced and, you know, if you could give us some advice on that, thank you. Okay, so about the first one, the first thing I would say is that you will always be frustrated with these <laughs> procedures. I mean, there's, it's very difficult. Uh, and as you said, if you centralize too much and you have everyone participating, people get frustrated. If you decentralize, people get frustrated too. It's very difficult. So that's why we try to um, make them compatible and to have a little bit of both. So the main decisions are made in the plenary. The very important ones are made through the online platform where we vote. Where we vote. Uh, because some, some decisions need to be, like, have a specific level of safety, safety uh, of security. Uh, you need to verify your ID, you need to, I mean, and the, the online platform is much safer in that regard. Um, so, usually what, so I said, the main decisions are made in the plenary, but then there are many other decisions that are, are not made in the plenary. And by the way, the plenary is not merely for voting. We also have like, de deliberation plenaries, uh, it, which means we just um, get together to discuss about certain important strategic topics specifically. And, and then we have, um, so the general coordination is in principle the, the, the organ who's supposed to make the decisions that you cannot, uh, that you need to make like right now. Uh, some, and it, it happens a lot, right? Sometimes we need to decide very quickly. And sometimes even we, we even decide through Telegram. Telegram is like WhatsApp. I don't know if you use it here. Uh, because like in, 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 a, in, a, in the group that we have, because we, we don't have the time to meet, for instance. Uh, so we, we make, someone makes a proposal and everyone says, okay, yes or no, and we somehow vote to have the most, the, the, the best possible uh, deci the decision, uh, even if we cannot have a real participatory decision-making procedure. And then what we do is every uh, coordinator goes to their group and shares this and gets feedback from those groups and then brings them back to the coordination. Sometimes we have we have time to do this before the decision is made and sometimes it means giving feedback and not uh, having people voting like in each group. 
but it's just the way it is. It's very difficult to to do it uh, otherwise. Uh, the, I guess the key is to find a balance between the two and to to have people participating as much as you can and to recognize that sometimes you cannot. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's difficult. And then about the um, voting and debating online, the th we started vo only voting online because it was <coughs> a platform that we didn't need to develop. We we bought the services from a, from a group of people who designed a, a platform uh, because we didn't, ha didn't have the resources. Uh, so we used that for many decisions. And then we started developing this other platform. And now we are uh, almost, well, we, are, we can actually use it, but we, haven't, we are not using it in the whole organization yet because we need to also give, um, uh, to teach many people how to use it because we have many old people who cannot simply just sign up and start using it. So it's a bit slow, but yeah, that's why we didn't use it before. And about the challenges, yeah, I would say the main challenge is how to make the quick decisions in a participatory manner. It's the, having an online platform is supposed to work better in this regard because you don't need to meet, you don't need to follow any calendar. You can just put a decision there and people can just participate. So it's supposed to help with this. But, and then another challenge I would say, the first thing that we mentioned, frustration. It's very hard to not to get frustrated because it's, I don't know, it's difficult to have a participatory platform. But yeah, I don't know. So I'm interested if you can remember any um, a process of um, making a decision where you capture that a significant amount of people changed their mind <clears throat> and how that happened and how did you deal with that, if you can remember any. Because I'm interested in, um, um, in the processes where the discussion and debate actually kind of was um, done in a way that some people change their mind because it seems to me that many of the processes just go in some kind of inertia where people get their um, decision before and then whatever you do it's it's really like hard to uh, change that i would say that in most cases where there is debate there's the possibility of changing people's minds and it it usually happens uh, of course, it's much harder to do this if, we, if you just ask people to vote directly. Uh, like voting online without debating, that's a case where it doesn't happen. Uh, or sometimes we need to vote very quickly and each coordinator asks their group to vote and then gives the, then votes back in the general coordination, then, then it, doesn't, it doesn't change people's views. But I think in most cases, since we, when we have the time, uh, most decisions are discussed in the general coordination and, it, and in each group. So it depends on how every group works, but usually it means that people can change their minds. And in many cases, we even send someone uh, who knows about the subject to give more information, for instance, and, and people, once they learn about what's happening, they, they change their mind about the topic, um, and in the plenaries, it's the same. Sometimes we have deliberative plenaries. This means that we discuss for, yeah, uh, almost uh, all the session. And some, sometimes we don't even vote about these things. It's just a matter of sharing people's, uh, people sharing their views and, and that's it. And sometimes we do vote. Uh, as a consequence of what we have been discussing, but I, yeah, I don't know. I, I couldn't. I couldn't. Pro I don't know if it, this answers your question, but it depends on the kind and the kind of decision. I would say. I have just a small technical question about this online platform. Uh, you said it uh, did it create much of the problems in terms of administering it. Uh, some a lot of extra work for the for the core group and. Uh, do people have troubles using it? Or do they prefer to stay on something that's familiar like uh, Facebook or some old school uh, uh, forums or something like that? Uh, we do need administrators. We actually, so we have people, we hired people to, 
to develop it, to develop it, and to to get it running. And then we will have so we we have we already have them, but it's not really working uh, yet. Uh, moderators for each group and a uh, um, person you can uh, send a message to to ask to solve problems. Yeah, uh, yeah. It it means having the resources to administer this. Yes, you need people doing it, and it's a lot of time. Um, and yeah, no, and we don't use any other. Uh, so the only thing that we use is Telegram, as I mentioned, uh, and each group is self-administered. So each each. It, each physical group in Barcelona and Comú has a Telegram group, and there are many others, like smaller working groups and stuff. But usually, yeah, that's the only forum we have besides the face-to-face -face meetings. And now the idea is to transfer those discussions, or some of them, to the online platform instead of doing those on Telegram. But it means having administrators and moderators, yes. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation, it was very useful. I would just like to take, uh, you to tell us a little bit more about uh, changing the discourse uh, that you were like uh, describing. Uh, as I understood, it's something that uh, the discourse that it became like more non-conflict and more affirmative, and uh, like the discourse that you are, to which you are offering some like new alternatives, and you're like not talking about the problems, but offering something new and something like that's uh, like an alternative which is good so as i understood it but maybe you can tell us a little bit more about it and is it something that you are the discourse t uh, towards the people you are commu communicating with from outside and from the uh, and to to people you're communicating with, with within the platform so if you can if you can tell us about a little bit more about that and give us uh, maybe give us examples of what kind of a discourse that is now I would I would say that one of the things. Um, so of course, part of the discourse was talking about the proposals that we were making for the city. Those proposals were made as, as a consequence of the crowdsource program, but uh, they ended up being like leftist proposals. And we talked a lot about the kind of city that we wanted. Um, about social rights, housing, the main problems of the city, about tourism and things like that. But making proposals, I mean, it's just about talking, it's, it's a matter of talking about the same topics, but instead of saying, um, I don't know, uh, this political party has been doing this in this way, and uh, they are corrupt, or they are whatever, or these people are responsible for this and that. It was about, specific, specifically during the campaign, it was about making a positive proposal. Because if you just do the first part and don't offer an alternative, people will say, okay, so what? You are going to solve this? How? Uh, you, and it's especially difficult if you, have, if you come from outside institutions because no one knows if you can really do this or not. Uh, and that's, that's something that was very problematic for us. Many people, as I was mentioning yesterday, many people thought that we, we didn't have the capacity to actually do anything. And yeah, so that, th this is one thing. But then I think the most important part during the campaign was not the focus on specific policies and proposals, like substantive proposals, but about the proposal that we made around how we wanted to do things, and who we were, why we did this, and why everyone, well, why this was everyone's business. And this is, it, it is a positive proposal, because it, the, the, the whole point was breaking the cycle of pessimism about the possibility of change, and saying, okay, just anyone can show up, and your participation is important, and the, the whole point is to have a city government that will do things differently, will talk to people, because we are normal people. Um, yeah, so it's the focus was, when we, when you, we put the focus on, on the way we did politics, and we want, or we wanted to do politics, I think it implied a critique, but we were not saying, those people don't represent us, and we know better. 
we were saying mm, it's obvious that everyone should participate in politics. We are going to do this. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's saying, the th saying the same thing, but in a different way. And it also, from more specifically from the uh, point of view of the communication strategy, we also didn't enter any confrontation situations because they were attacking us a lot, uh, even personal attacks, like towards specific people. And there, uh, the, the strategy was the same. We wouldn't respond. We wouldn't. Uh, we wouldn't say anything. Okay, you can you can say whatever you want. We we are going to do this anyway. And because otherwise you are you are giving. So we were in, at the at the. Um, uh, sent, we were the focus of the campaign because we're the weird ones. And every time someone attacked us and we replied back, we were giving, uh, we were giving space to those uh, other people. And we were sharing like, the, the attention with them. And that's something that we didn't want to do. So we, at some point we, did, we said, I mean, it, it was very difficult because when they say something about you that it's not true, of course you want to fight back. But I, th I don't know, it's, it worked well. And of course, at some, there were certain very like, problematic things that we did uh, reply to. But in general, we just said, OK, just, I don't know, it doesn't matter. We were just go on and pro make our proposal. I think it's all, I don't know, it's, it, it's not about specific things, but about like, the general approach. Um, I think that's, I don't know, it, at least it helped us a lot there in that specific moment, in that specific context. But it's, it's difficult. It was a risky bet, and, but it did work. I don't know. OK. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, we can have a 15 minutes break, and then we continue at noon with the uh, debate on the new municipalism uh, with Tomislav Medak, uh, uh, Radomir Lazovic, and Ivan Machutic. So we have 15 minutes break for coffee and uh, other things, and we continue. Laura, thank you again.